All right, how's it going everyone? My name is Matt, and today I'm going to be discussing a brief history of magnetic data storage. So a quick overview of what I will be going over today. First, some basic physics of the first hard drive and then its development. Uh, then I'll be discussing some significant advancements in this technology between 1952 and today. And then uh, briefly go over some advancements that are coming down the pipe. So you also notice this photo on the right. That is one of the engineers at IBM in 1952, Wes Dickinson, sitting next to the first ever hard drive. Uh, notice that is just the hard drive component of the computer and it is comparable in size to a fully grown man. So as far as the physics for that first hard drive that was made, um, it really comes down just to these three concepts. Uh, we have Faraday's law, Ampere's law, the magnetization. So Faraday's law, if you have a closed loop, change the magnetic flux through that loop, a voltage is induced on the outer edge to cancel out that change, straightforward. Ampere's law, we just need to know the field that's created inside of a solenoid with N loops, I current going through it, and then the length of the solenoid. And magnetization, uh, we all have seen this exact plot a couple hundred times at this point in the semester. So putting all these things together, so this is from a text that I found that was published in 1957. So the core concepts are really straightforward. If you just have this iron core sort of yoke, that C shape up at the top, run a current through the loops on the outer side, that changes the magnetization of that iron core, which in, in turn changes the magnetization of the platter down below, move the head away. Then at a later date, you bring the reed coil, and as you move it towards that remnant's magnetization, you get an increase in flux through those loops that induces a voltage. And then as you move away from that uh, spot on the platter, the flux decreases, so you still have a rate of change, you get a signal. And that's it. That is all of the core physics that was involved in 1952 to make the first hard drive. All right, so we've got an idea of how to do this, but why? Why did we want this advancement? What was behind it? So previously to the magnetic hard drives, uh, folks used magnetic tape or just punch cards. And this was referred to as sequential access memory. So we're all now keenly aware of random access memory. This was its precursor where for the case of a tape, you got to go from top to bottom. You have to read that thing in order. And a punch card, you have to put them into the machine sequentially. You can't jump around. And that also caused some problems with when you wanted to change data because you had to do everything in batches. Obviously, with a punch card, you can't put back the punch you took out. That's not how this works. And then with a the tape, to overwrite a portion, you have to wind all the way to the top, roll down, find where you want to overwrite, overwrite, and then continue on with the tape. Now, as far as data storage is concerned, the first hard drive was actually worse than magnetic tapes that were being used at the time. Uh, but the engineers believed this would scale better and uh -huh, they were very correct. So that's the why. As far as who put this together, there are three names that kept popping up in all of my research. So first pictured is Ray Johnson. He was the gentleman in charge of running this lab in San Jose, California in the early 1950s. And then there were two other engineers that popped up a lot. So one was Wes Dickinson. You guys saw him pictured on that outline slide. He was the engineer in charge of designing the servos. So the actual carriage mechanism that would move these read and write heads from platter to platter, which was obviously a big deal. And then the last guy, uh, Al Hoagland, he was an outside consultant for IBM uh, because he was an expert on magnetic materials at the time. Now, one thing that's just kind of fun to point out is that he was a grad student at UC Berkeley. So there is a joke here about even back in the 50s, people getting grad students to do all their work for them. So these were some internal documents from IBM uh, in 1953 about what this first hard drive design would look like. So the first thing I want to bring your attention to is these platters are massive. They are two feet in diameter. So because they're so big, if there's any sort of wobbling as they're rotating, uh, that displacement at the outer edge is gonna be pretty significant. Two feet, even a little displacement from that perfect angle, you're gonna have a lot of wobbling. So one really creative solution that they came up with was to keep the heads from crashing into the platter. They installed an air hose that would constantly be blowing out air. So when that platter wobbled, the head would always have a cushion of air between it and the platter so it wouldn't actually crash. Now, the materials that they used for this first setup were uh, bad. The iron oxide paint that they used to actually magnetize, uh, Ray Johnson compared it to the same paint that was used to paint the Golden Gate Bridge. So this is just like hardware store paint that they have. It's not anything particularly fancy. And the last really interesting detail about this is that when they were testing the initial ramp up, so they have these spacers between the platters, so they have a big enough spot for the read and write heads to go in between them. 
they just had two platters on either end and then just filled the rest of the area with spacers and then ramped it up and it exploded and it shattered. And they took the time to get a photo of Wes Dickinson on a journey to go to the hospital instead of you know making sure he was okay. So a little fun, interesting side note, that's from Wes Dickinson's autobiography that came out in 2003. So uh, that's how it was made, what it looks like. These are some of the signals you could expect to see from this first hard drive. So the writing current is pretty straightforward. To change the magnetization in that iron oxide layer, you just send pulses of opposite direction. That's straightforward. The second line right here is the magnetic flux you would see through the read head as you approach the written bit and then leave the written bit. So you see it increases, reaches the peak, decreases. Then in the case of the opposite bit, it's just a sign change. And then same thing with the voltage signal that you get from that read head as you approach and then depart. So you see that nice sort of sinusoidal shape. So those are the signals that we uh, would see in the early 1950s. But obviously there's been a lot of advancements over the last 70 so odd years. So those really fall into two main categories, either advancements in the head, so reading or writing, and then advancements in the platter themselves, so how to hold this data. So some of the, they basically, uh, when you have the head, you have the single goal, if you want to increase the signal to noise ratio. Uh, if you can increase that signal to noise, you can detect smaller and smaller changes in magnetization. Great. Uh, two just really straightforward advancements that I'm not going to talk about much, are just adding some shielding to the read head. If you shield the read head, you're not getting extraneous fields from other tracks. Great, makes sense. As well as replacing that induction that I discussed with magnetic tunnel junctions, which we've discussed about in this course uh, quite a bit. So I'm mainly gonna be talking about some neat advancements in the platter technology, just to increase the data density over time. Mm -hmm. So the two that I'll be focusing on are doing the perpendicular magnetization. So instead of writing in plane, you write perpendicular to the plane, and as well as something called shingled magnetic recording. Now, you'll notice that I've got some dates there. So for the perpendicular magnetization, there was a paper that came out in 1979 out of a lab in Japan that first theorized this would be good for commercial products. But it didn't actually come to fruition until 1986, where it was made in floppy disks. For those of you that are over the age of like 25, I think you guys know what a floppy disk is. Uh, that company went bankrupt, and it wasn't until 2006 that this really took off when Seagate made a commercial hard drive that utilized perpendicular magnetization. So perpendicular magnetization, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the biggest change was adding a soft magnetic underlayer and changing the orientation of the right head. So instead of having the field go through that platter layer, it penetrates it to the field below, or uh, sorry, to the underlayer below, and then that field is able to return to some of the shielding on the read heads. So this just allowed for increased bit density because of instead of writing in plane, you're writing perpendicular to the plane. Cool, great. And then as far as the shingled writing goes, so this was a surprisingly big advancement in terms of data storage density. So from this little plot here, you can see the write head is significantly bigger than the read head. It takes a lot more stuff to change the magnetization of something than it does just to detect the magnetization. So what they, uh, this was again, Seagate did this in 2010, was they just started overwriting some previous tracks as long as it wasn't underneath the read head. Now, one of the downsides to this is that it did increase the write time, because if you wanted to change, say, like track n plus one, first you had to go write uh, track n plus two or something like that. So then you made sure that you weren't ever losing data. So those are two uh, things that have increased data storage. Oh, forgot to mention uh, that shingled uh, increased data storage capacity by about 25 percent as soon as it was put out. So it was a really pretty much instantaneous leap in data density. So some future advancements. So we always have the same goal. We always want higher bit density on the platter. We want more data closer together. But the problem is that we've now reached a point where with the materials that we're using, you need such high fields to change the magnetization that to really get stuff closer together, you need bigger right heads, which kind of defeats the purpose of trying to make stuff smaller. So one of the solutions that's been proposed is to temporarily reduce the required field in a very small area. And there are two main methods that companies are pursuing to achieve this goal. So heat-assisted magnetic recording, HAMR, and then microwave-assisted magnetic recording. Okay, so first I'll talk about HAMR. So the meat and potatoes of this is in order to change the required field at a very small spot, they use heat. And this heat is generated through optics. Now. They have a very interesting problem in that the bit size is smaller 
than the diffraction limit for the light that they're using. So they can only get light to focus on a circle with a diameter of about 100 nanometers, which is about 10 times too big for what we want. So how they get around this is instead of focusing light on the platter itself, they focus the light on this little pinhead looking apparatus right here. And then that focuses the heat down to the platter below. Now, one little side note is that Seagate is actually, they've started doing this and they anticipate putting hard drives out by the end of the third fiscal quarter, which I think that means summer. So, uh, and then they had a roadmap for 50 terabytes coming within the next three years or so for these hard drives. So that's one method of doing this. Uh, the other method was microwave assisted magnetic recording. So that's done instead of attaching an optical fiber to your right hand, you have this field generating layer. So that's the FGL spin toward oscillator. So you run field polarized current through that generating layer. That creates microwaves as the spin uh, changes orientation that are, that are released and then hit the platter down below. So that serves the same purpose of lowering that required field to cause that magnetization to change. Now, I couldn't find any additional like company press releases on this since February of last year, but uh, Toshiba, their next step. So some conclusions. With just those three basic physics concepts in 1955, I think the first hard drive was released, uh, people were able to achieve 2,000 bits per square inch. Okay, fine. Uh, because of the advancements in material science, so shifting from hardware store iron oxide paint to now cobalt-based alloys, and I think I saw iron platinum as something that's being used nowadays, advancements in the read and write head, so shifting from that induction to the magnetic tunnel junctions, utilizing shingled and then perpendicular magnetic recording. And then even with the addition of the HAMR, we're now able to achieve uh, two terabits per square inch. Mm -hmm. So going from 2000 to two times 10 to the 12, uh, which is a very big jump. And uh, I have a lot of references. I went down a rabbit hole. I started having a lot of fun reading about this. So sorry, everyone.